We did that. So, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself personally and about our company. Uh, but again, I'd like to be as much question and answer as possible, and I'll take them up as they come up in your mind. Just raise your hand, and we'll, we'll dive in on the topic. Um, things I'll, I'll try to impair, uh, impart to you throughout is that um, lifelong learning is something that you're engaged in now, and you will always engage in, and it's something that you should really embrace. It creates the opportunity for you, no matter where you go in your life. If you were willing to invest in and better yourself through learning, uh, it's really paid dividends for myself, uh, enriched my life, and uh, I'm really here to recommend uh, strongly to you. <clears throat> uh, another part we'll talk about, if I can get to it, in our time today is about leadership. I found that leadership skills are critical to every stage of your life, every element of your life, not just the workplace, personal life. Uh, so I can share with you a few uh, tips and pointers that I've learned along the way. And then uh, lastly, uh, I, when I talk to some uh, university folks, you know, they're, they're in a, out on the job search. What kind of a career path do I have? What kind of an organization do I want to work for? Uh, the organizational culture is really important. And you as uh, candidates should be interviewing those companies as aggressively as they interview you. So we can talk a little bit about organizational culture. But I understand that we're talking to uh, uh, some advertising and marketing interested folks here today, so I'm happy to share as much of, about my job as that relates to that topic uh, as possible. Okay, and I'll also share with you a couple of wise quotes that I'd uh, like to share with my uh, <coughs> uh, workforce as well. Um, and you, I think you're on the path of finding what you are most passionate about. That, if that's your job, it, it, every day is easy, every day is enjoyable. You can enjoy getting up in the morning, um, putting in your best effort, going home and putting your head on the pillow and, and sleeping very well because you, you've accomplished something, you're making progress in a direction that's something that you feel very strongly about. So um, <clears throat> and don't be worried if you haven't found that passion exactly yet. You know, taking these classes, taking other classes, uh, volunteering and working in other organizations, that's how you find uh, your passion. That's where I, I found there's certain things that come very easy to me, and um, not many, <laughs> but the, but the few that do come easy to me. Um, that's 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 where your passion lies. So that's that's when your day job is, is very uh, rewarding. So uh, always keep that in mind. <clears throat> so uh, as Ben mentioned, um, 33 years in civil and environmental engineering. Consulting engineering is not something, and when I sat in your seat uh, in my uh, bachelor's of science study, in my senior year even, I didn't know what a consulting engineer did, so I'll share with you a little bit about that. Um, we're basically an engineer for rent. If you have an engineering need for a project or a compliance issue or anything to do with, uh, in our case, civil and environmental engineering, we, we, we deal with everything that touches the ground. We don't design high-rise structures, but we might design the site improvements that go support it, the utility connections associated with it. My specialty is on water and wastewater uh, treatment. So I went on to get my master's in environmental engineering from NGIT uh, with a focus on physical and chemical treatment. I'm talking about something that you're passionate about or comes easy to you. Chemistry was not one of those. I, I had to take multiple classes over and over again to finally get to that degree. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> and then, as Ben mentioned, 30 years in the industry as a consulting engineer, getting hired and doing various projects. That's what I like about consulting engineering. It's not the same thing every day. It's, uh, it's a different task. Uh, a client might have a need in one category that you design an improvement um, and see it constructed and that's very rewarding. The next day it's a very different topic. Same type of a need but different topic. So it's very, it's a nice, uh, a lot of diversity in what we do. But then, uh, you know, it, it, engineering is funny. I think it's just like any other uh, type of job. When you do your job well, you get promoted to the next one. And then you do more of good things, you learn more tools on the job, you get promoted, you get uh, advanced in your career to the point where you're obsolete. What you went to school for in your experience is not why you're being promoted. You're getting promoted into other areas of expertise and challenges. And that's where I recognize that in running a company or being asked to run a company, I was not prepared to run a company. I didn't understand accounting, finance, marketing, all these elements of how you successfully run a business. All I knew was the engineering part. So I went back and got an MBA 
uh, 30 years later, and um, it has really enabled me to uh, guide our company uh, in the right direction, uh, apply things I learned in that curriculum. You know, as a student of older tr uh, than traditional age, you bring a lot of experience in that learning, and it's very valuable. So <clears throat> that was a fun experiment for me to go back to school and, and get that credential, but more importantly, it was how I applied it to my job. So our company uh, is based in New Jersey. Um, we have 170 employees now. Uh, we have four offices, three in New Jersey and one in uh, Georgia. And that's just come, come to fruition just by sheer uh, client satisfaction, repeat client type work. So we're talking about marketing uh, and sales and advertisement. Our, what we sell is our intellect and our time. We build by the hour for, if I spend an hour working on your project, that's what I charge you and hopefully you're getting some value for that. If you don't feel like you're getting value, you go to some other firm. So we are go out of our way to train everybody in our company to understand that this is the business we're in. We're not selling a product so much as we are selling a service, a professional service. Um, but that client-facing, client-focused uh, uh, core value that we have is, is to ensure that the client is getting the best value from us, uh, the best communication, most accurate product. These are all things that people come back to us time and time again because we're delivering on that promise, on that commitment. So when we go to uh, advertise our service, you know what can we say? Engineers have a code of ethics. We can't say that we're better than the next engineer because all engineers are created equal. They have the credentials, the professional uh, uh, experience, the licensing necessary to provide an engineering service. So. We can't really compare ourselves to the next firm, so we're careful not to do that. But we can highlight and differentiate um, our strategy, our unique aspect of what we do, maybe a little differently than what other people do. Strategy is that which uh, differentiates you from your competitor. So we are very focused on uh, proactive communication with our client. And our client should never be surprised by anything on a project because we should have already prep them for that and told them about it. So that uh, is really an important element of our advertisement and our marketing uh, that we promote, and a lot of our clients do appreciate that. <clears throat> so we do engineering, land surveying, uh, GIS. Um, we focus a lot on utility infrastructure. This, it's, you can appreciate what it takes uh, in the Northeast, at least, uh, aging infrastructure. You know, uh, Things that are underground are 100 years old. They're not going to last much longer, so we do a lot of rehabilitation and replacement of that type of infrastructure. Uh, so that's the technical aspect. But more importantly, you know how we relate with our clients. We, we build a trusting relationship with that client, and that's by telling them what we're going to do, delivering on that, and ensuring that they're satisfied with that product. <clears throat> that's that's our best method of marketing and advertising that creates for follow-on sale. Um, our vision statement is ensuring a better tomorrow through progress today. Uh, what that means is when we go to work, we should be working on something for the betterment of our client. If our, our client has an expectation that we are working on their project, and as consulting engineers, we have more than one project. So not every day does every project get worked on, but if something doesn't get worked on for a week or a month, the client expected that it was. If we were proactive in our communication to that client, they are at least informed as to why it worked, worked on or why it was not, and that's the juggling act. So we're, we're uh, managers of time more than we are any other technical aspect in, in our job. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that's an important thing we try to teach everybody in our company to be aware of. Let me just show you a quick, if it'll play, a uh, video of, this is a promotional video, I'm not sure we'll see if it goes. Um, that we prepared, just to highlighting what uh, what we do, the skills that we, uh, uh, the services that we offer. Looks like it may not want to load, so. But this is, this is a, a marketing uh, tool and an advertisement tool that we've prepared. And um, I'm gonna regret that I didn't check, test this sooner, but if it does play, I'll, I'll ask you to critique it and tell me what you think it tells you about our company, if a, if a message is, is translated uh, accurately. I'll give it a minute. <clears throat> Is there any questions so far about consulting engineering or how we market and sell our services?
you emphasize communication. Yeah. I'm a little seasoned as well. The modes of communication have evolved over the course of years. Do you find yourself communicating more via email and then texting as well? And does that concern you at all to put something in writing in the course of communication? That's, that's a great question. And it's um, <clears throat> one that you can all appreciate, I'm sure. You communicate in many means. In the professional world, uh, we have created a, uh, an outline of prioritization of how, what type of communication should be used under what scenario. I use a rule of thumb where if I'm communicated to in a certain format, I reply with that same format. So if somebody calls me on the phone, I don't email them back, I call them back. If I can't get them, then I might follow up with an email. But the primary mode of communication is always on the same level, if you will. Um, so, and, and as consultants, we really still find that the, the, the verbal communication, even if it's virtual through uh, Teams or Zoom, is probably the best value. You see the body language, you see the, uh, uh, the, the nuances about what's being said, how it's being said. Uh, the, the, the written communication through email or text or chat is just so, it's, it's one step removed. Um, so it's not as effective as, as, as our experience. So we prioritize the verbal or in-person type of communication first. Always respond in the way that you get it. Uh, it's so frustrating to me that um, we get a, uh, a message via Teams or Zoom, and then somebody else emails back on that topic, and they're not even connected. You can't even follow the chain of communication. So it's really reckless in terms of a professional service organization trying to uh, uh, make sure that we have a paper trail or uh, we, we, have, we have professional liability that we have to make sure that we can defend ourselves. If somebody asks a question and we respond with an answer, we have to be able to recreate that and justify why we said it. Uh, is it accurate? You know, could it be challenged? So communication is really a, a critical part of our business and the prioritization of how we communicate. I mean, personally, uh, the text message, I take that as the highest priority. So I give everybody my cell phone, but text me only if you really need me now, because otherwise, Put it in an email because I have the opportunity to sort that, reply in the order in which it was came in, and then have a, a paper trail of how that's done. We even save those emails in our uh, digital uh, file management structure in our company, so there's, it's, it's a really a comprehensive uh, paper trail. The chats and messages with Zoom or Teams are really just for the, the one-off while you're on a meeting. I don't like to use that as a, as a third means because there's just so many modes of communication available now. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to keep up with it all. If I'm, on your phone, you have the text, the Teams chat, the email, the voicemail. It's just too many modes to be able to be effective and respond in everything in a timely fashion. So that's uh, that's our rule of thumb right now. Um, as we hire more and more young people, they come in with great skills and other techniques that some of us folks that are a little bit more experienced learn from. So it's a two-way street. Uh, we, we impart to you to say, please use this method of communication, but when you come and say, well, this is more effective, here's why. You know, hopefully we're listening and we, we adapt our uh, policies over time. I apologize, this is not going to uh, load, so we'll have to pretend this is so what we talked about. Okay. This is just another inspirational uh, item. Uh, you know, champions are defined not by uh, their victories, but uh, when they when they fall, or when they have a failure, how do they respond? Uh, that's really a measure of character. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about character in a minute, uh, but that's really an important measure of uh, who you are and you know what caliber you would rise to in any of your uh, challenges uh, in your career or in your personal life. <coughs> infomercial that we did, which isn't going to learn. So I love this one about leadership. We'll just talk briefly about leadership. Uh, compelling others to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. They didn't necessarily know they wanted to do it, but after you gave them some guidance, uh, some structure, interacted with them, communicated with them, they bought on to the concept that you wanted to accomplish, and they take charge. They, they take ownership of that topic, and they run with the torch. Um, and now you've accomplished your goal with others around you. And that's what I'm talking about, leadership at every level. Every one of you can implement this. It's not just delegating and trying to deflect and have somebody else do your job, but it's building that relationship where you're both 
sharing and a common vision of what can be accomplished and how do you get there. And those folks that are uh, challenged and they want to know that they're going to be able to get this done for you, they're motivated to do that. So this is, if you take one thing away from our talk today, there's three key words that I always associate with leadership. And it's something I learned from uh, a rear admiral in the Navy uh, was at a function. He talked about capability. You are here today building your capability set. You're going to have education. You're going to have some practical experience. Uh, whatever, whatever field or topic it's in, you cannot be a leader, looked upon as a leader, if you don't have some of the key answers in your field of expertise. So you want to build that capability set, your ability to listen, your ability to understand what the uh, rules and policies are in the, uh, the work world that you're in, or even personally, what's, what's the rules of engagement. If somebody needs that answer, hopefully you have enough of a skill set to either get them the answer or know where to find it. And now you've enabled them, you've given them the tools that they need to succeed, and that's your role as a leader. So your capability is really uh, uh, something you're gonna continue to build on, that lifelong learning I've talked about. That's a, that's a key thing, but you can't be a leader with just that skill uh, of capability. You also have to be approachable. Approachability is one thing that we really uh, preach and demonstrate in our company, and uh, no one should feel intimidated by coming to you with a question, a suggestion. That's a collaboration that we want to have every day in our uh, business and in our personal lives, because it, it validates everyone's contribution to the, the greater cause. Uh, if you can feel free to come forward with an idea, with a question, say, I'm not sure why we do it this way, or, or why is email the only way we can communicate when I have this opportunity? Like, that's a real dialogue. And as, as, as you get further up in the career, you get a little more distance from uh, the, the, the boots on the ground or the day-to-day -day, um, procedures. And, and you can become obsolete. But if you're approachable, that workforce is out there dealing with the issues in the construction on our civil engineering job. The contractor broke another pipe. Well, why does he keep doing that? Well, we didn't have it accurate on our plans. If that information comes back, we, we find a solution. We find a better way to do the job the next time, and we learn from it. That approachability is the, the, the glue that makes that happen. And lastly, humility, as many of you know, is, is a key character trait uh, if you're not humble enough to recognize that you don't have all the answers, that we do make mistakes, and you own up to it, that is what builds the trust among everybody that you interact with. And they're going to appreciate you and your leadership skills if you can acknowledge those uh, uh, learning opportunities, as I would call it. So that's, those are three words, capability, approachability, and humility, that I would really ask you to remember in terms of your leadership skills. And change. Leaders are agents of change. And change will not come. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So anytime you see an opportunity for change or a need for change, it, it's on you. you. You're the first person to think about it or recognize it. You need to bring that forward, whether it's you escalate it up the ladder in your organization, you talk to your peers about it, say, hey, if you have this problem, what do you think about this? Like, that's what an own, uh, agent of change should undertake. And that's really what we want to uh, <clears throat> carry ourselves with day to day. So in our company, we have a leadership library. We ask a lot of our uh, uh, employees to, you know, if they're going on vacation or traveling for work, grab a book. You know, if you have a few minutes, read it. Uh, a lot of the principles that I'm talking about here are found in a lot of these books. There's a lot of great books out there about leadership. And, um, and everyone has a, a responsibility to, to try to improve themselves, whether it be through professional advancement, um, you know, degrees and licensing, but this is a way that you can improve yourself uh, just in your day-to-day -day, uh, skills. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of great authors out there. And, you know, we don't recommend anyone in particular, but we just make them available to our company employees because as you read these things, you start to think like we think, you align yourself with what we're trying to accomplish. And if you can eliminate the conflict and the friction in an organization, where when somebody thinks one thing and somebody else thinks something different, so when they're both given the same uh, circumstances, they might make two different decisions, that's never good. That, that creates a lot of chaos, a 
lot of friction, it slows things down, it's inefficient. If you can all be thinking of the same common goal, uh, you define the same leadership skills, and when given those two situations, arrive at the same conclusion or the same common goal, uh, that's really efficient. And in business, efficiency is, is profit, and that's what matters. So lastly, success is a lousy teacher. Um, it, it seduces you into thinking you can't lose. Uh, I like that quote because uh, I, I take away from that. You never stop learning. Um, just because you, you achieve some level of what you measure as success doesn't mean uh, you, you can't do more, and it doesn't mean you can't help others do more. So there's always a constant evolution of uh, success, and always be, you know, you've never figured it all out is the bottom line. You're always gonna continue to learn, and life is gonna deal you a few surprises along the way, um, and that's, that's just, you, you've never figured it all out. And there's one other topic I can, before we get into a few uh, discussions more on marketing and advertisement. Um, this is what, when we interview candidates, and this is a little career advice for you, and your resumes, your interview skills, be aware that what the employer is really looking to find out is what is your character? How does it align with their organization and their priorities? So if you can do a little homework about the characteristics of a company, the culture of that company, where their priorities are, and see if it aligns with yours, you're not gonna be wasting your time. That's a good investment of your time, even before you speak to anybody uh, in terms of interview or opportunities. But the character matrix is something we look at. Everybody has a range of capabilities, and as an entry level person, it might be limited from what you've learned in school or the few internship experiences you've had. Over time, you build that capability set. But you also have a character set. That's the vertical axis. And you're born with some character traits, you learn some, you demonstrate some, you may inherit uh, or take on some that are less uh, attractive to corporate employers than others. So you have to be careful that you don't get yourself into a, a character skills or a character level that's on the bottom half of this curve because that's not what employers look for. They really want somebody with high level character and I'm here to tell you that if you come in with a high level character, I can train you to do any job I need you to do. Everybody's trainable, you know, they have education skills, and you can move from a B to an A in, in very quick time. And that's that top right box is where you want to be to be recognized in your career, uh, to be able to advance, to be able to achieve your goals. If you're on the lower half of this, you're, you're never going to be more than a C plus in, in, in my book. Um, and that's not necessarily somebody I really need in my organization because that character uh, that's low, that has flaws, it has uh, potential to disrupt and upset the organization and create a, a, a bad reputation. So we always look to see, and, and your character is evidence not only about how you answer an interview question, it's what's on your resume, it's what your references say about you. So just be aware that it's what your uh, digital media footprint says about you. Just be aware that that's all out there and employers are really looking to measure your character as much as they are looking to measure your, your capability and skill. I think that's probably all I have for discussion. Organizational culture we talked a little bit about in our company. Um, we really, really do promote a, a, a cooperative, open door, uh, family type organization. 170 people, it's kind of hard to do it. To call it a family, but um, everybody's supportive. We are one organization. We don't have silos or different competing uh, aspects to our business. We try to promote it all uh, as one. Set a common goal. If, if we meet our company goals by the end of the year, we take the week off between Christmas and New Year's. That's the bonus and the reward and everyone benefits from that. It's not just a, a financial, but it's also a nice uh, you know, respite at the end of, the, of a hard year. Uh, so that's, you know, you, as I said before, you want to be interviewing those firms that you talk to as aggressively as they talk to you. And I think that's it. So that's my spiel. I hope we should get into more of this guy. Yeah. yeah, let's see if I can uh, pull up this video. Go ahead. Sure. Time and did I trip any nerves or generate any inquiry? Any questions? Most most eyes are still open. That's good news. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm curious about like your 
experience in engineering and how you think like your study of that and your interest in that informs how you do leadership or like your leadership style? So that's a great question because as a, a, a STEM uh, related uh, student, you know, all, all I was uh, trained to do was evaluate the data, you know, postulate what needs to happen, crunch some numbers, evaluate those options, and make a recommendation on what the outcome or the solution should be. And that, that was a process that we uh, you know, do time and time again, in math problems, science problems, what have you. So as an engineering, we're, we're here to solve the problems, right? It's, and theoretically, we should be able to solve them all. Uh, leadership skills has shown me a different aspect of that, and is that I don't have all the answers. And it's okay that I don't have all the answers. I have a, a personal mission statement that I, I really seek to surround myself with people who have, I'll say, greater capabilities or more broad capabilities than I have. And when I have that around me, I'm much more successful. And that's our company is evidence of that. So I feel like the scientific method of my uh, STEM training was the starting point, and it enables me to solve problems, continue to solve problems today. But it was the leadership skills that opened my eyes to the fact that it's not just me, it's not just the data that I've been given, it's a lot more out there, and when you aggregate that and uh, incorporate that into the process, the outcomes are so much better. Uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a linear way of thinking compared to a, a 360. So that's, that would be my analogy. Um, you mentioned a variety of times how leadership skills are really important, and I was curious when you're hiring employees, like what do you look at their resume? Do you have certain questions to figure out, like do they exemplify these leadership skills? And if so, like what answers are you looking for, or like what things do you want to see out of employees that are applying? Yeah, that, that's, that's another great question. So, leadership skills are are most uh, readily evidenced by what you're. Uh, extracurricular activities are, what your uh, role in an organization has been. So that's the, I'll say that's the first cut in terms of if somebody's got a, a broad, in addition to the curriculum that they are successful at with the GPA, uh, what are the other extracurricular activities and are they in a, in a role, if they just were members of 10 clubs, that's one thing, but if they were the leader of one or if they can provide evidence of this is where the question comes in. Tell me a situation where you had to uh, use a leadership skill or work with a group, and what was the outcome, or what did you learn from that? If they can, I'll say, speak to it from experience, that's, uh, that shows me that they have learned, or at least attempted, some type of a leadership uh, role. And that's, uh, that's, I always like to dive in further. So I ask the first question, they give me the response that I, they think they want me to hear. I'm gonna ask them further detail and dive in deeper on that topic to really see is it truly what they learned from or are they just trying to help you know, paint a picture that may not be the true person that I was really interested to hear about. So, so just be prepared for that follow-up question, the deep dive on uh, the topic. But I think leadership skills in general is, is the extracurricular, um, other organizations, and then personal, it could be a personal story uh, that didn't even involve other people or organizations, but how you took charge of your own life or made a critical decision or learned from a critical mistake, that's just as much and probably more important about leadership than it is in organizations. So if you have a personal story that you can share with an interviewer, it, it, it does two things. One is it demonstrates you know, there's a leadership aspect or skill set built into this person, which I appreciate. Secondly, um, it defines who you are. And they're gonna remember that more than the 10 other resumes or interviews they had that same day. That one person who brought up that unique experience, either the interview can relate to it, or they can at least appreciate that you're willing to share and you know, be approachable and feel humble about his experience. Now you've demonstrated those leadership skills. Well, let's, let's uh, maybe see some of these oh, videos. Oh, sure. So these, yeah, okay. So I'm imagining they're on your website here? I, I assume so, yeah. Okay. So again, I apologize. I have not the, I, we have a marketing department, uh, seven people, uh, one of which is my daughter, Hope and Rab. Um, and then we have another four uh, client development or sales type people. So there's 11 people in a firm of 170 people. So we're, I mean, five, six percent of our company is targeted at marketing and sales. So 
Without them, yes, we would struggle, but we got a lot of repeat work just by doing our day job without a big marketing push or a big advertising push. In fact, during COVID, we uh, didn't go to any professional trade organizations, uh, conferences, promotional stuff, and sure enough, our revenue was right on pace with where it should have been. So, like, I'm the, uh, the anti-marketing guy in the firm. Like, do we even need to do this anymore? We're, we're spending how much money on client entertainment and promotional and flying people over the country? And uh, at the end of the day, we didn't do it that year, and we still made our revenue objective. That's a very short-sighted view. There's, there's definitely a need to build momentum and name recognition, and I'm wearing my logo on my shirt. That's a big promotional thing. Um, so we uh, we really do know there's value there, but I, I just uh, always like to question it, just to make sure we're getting the best bang for the buck. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I forgot why I was answering that question. <laughs> well, let, let's take a look. project-centric, um, and that, that's just promotional-wise, we try to highlight our successes with certain clients, and, and they tell their friends, and uh, other clients have a similar need, they call us and hire us, so that's what a lot of these are designed to do, is just uh, do some outreach. Um, the one with the map, that's uh, that one, try that. This was targeted at the uh, water, the drinking water industry. service and the client need 
And then all those other states you saw highlighted are ones that I'm either licensed as an engineer in, and we have boots on the ground, we have people working in that state, not at an office, but in a field application, a field job. Well, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, as these students think about moving into uh, to their careers and then ultimately setting themselves up for leadership roles, I wonder if you could tell a little bit more from stories that you may have seen and, and people that you've encountered or even your own stories about, uh, is it too early to think about leadership uh, early on in your career when you're starting, or, or what, what do they need to think? Yeah, I think, as I said, as I led off with, you know, not necessarily knowing where your passion lies right now. Um, keep figuring it out. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep educating yourself, taking on new initiatives or educational uh, or experience, work experiences and learn from those. See who you're working with. See what tools and techniques they use. And those people in those industries that you're uh, interacting with, you see, you can kind of tell who is uh, committed and engaged and who will advance in that career and who's just there just because it's a day job and just trying to get by. Um, it's those folks that are committed and engaged who are going to advance. You want to see why is it they're that way. Are they uh, particularly gifted in that technical area or are they uh, particularly well trained? What is it about it that they motivates them? Because when they're motivated and engaged, they're most successful and that's the people who are going to uh, uh, you know, advance. So as you figure these things out in your career, uh, you know, always keep your eyes open for those other people, peers, uh, supervisors, what have you, that are going to be uh, measured uh, from a successful standpoint. But the leadership, I, I, I think I've preached, it's at every level. It's, it's you today are leaders. You're leading your own charge. You're leading among other peers on certain topics, among family, among other church activities, what have you. you you're involved, you're engaged, and you're applying those capability, approachability, humility, aspects to your day. And that never goes away. You want to make sure you always embrace that at every level of your uh, career development. And be prepared. You're going to change your mind a thousand times. And you're going to change jobs tens of times, probably. You know, the, the, the long-term, single job career, I, I don't know anybody, even at my age now, that had that. It's, it's evolved. I've been at this firm for 25 years. I've been a consulting engineer for 33 years. But it wasn't for the same firm, and it's certainly not the same job. I'm now a business leader. I, I don't hardly do any engineering anymore. So that's an evolution that's occurred in my life. My daughter who went to school here got a degree in Bible. She was going to uh, do Bible translation. And she went on to get her uh, master's in linguistics. And uh, through COVID and other international challenges, her mission works kind of fell apart, and now, right now, she's, she's working in marketing, and she's actually our DEI coordinator at our firm. A firm of 170 people needs to have DEI uh, and embrace it every day in our recruiting, in our work culture, in our office, in our HR policies, and she, that's her role. So she's taking Bible and linguistics and applying it to a bunch of technical people, and uh, it's an interesting challenge for her, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great example that you don't know where your career path is going to lead, and you should be prepared to accept every challenge and embrace it and learn from it. And if it's not for you, then find the next opportunity. Um, and that, that'll, that'll be, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. That, that's going to happen time and time again. What do you know now that you wish that you knew when you were uh, graduating from college? Yeah, when I graduated, I, I think it, I, my expectation was that um, I, I didn't know everything. And I was afraid that I would be asked to do things that I didn't know how to do. And I didn't, I guess, I guess my understanding was that may not be acceptable and I may lose my job because of it. But in the work environment we have today, and I think even back then, it was okay. It was okay to be uh, unprepared or ill-equipped. But if you had a commitment to better yourself and learn, that's all that matters. And like I said, with the character matrix, we can train anyone to do anything, and it's just a matter of uh, their willingness to participate in that process. If their doors are closed and they're not willing to be open and engaging, uh, committed to that, then it's going to be very hard to, to, to make that happen. But I, I, back then, if I knew now, or if I knew then what I know now about 
uh, acceptance and your ability to be a lifelong learner and what that can achieve for you. I think I would add a more, uh, I, I never realized at that time that I could be uh, at a certain level of success that I valued and measured. I wasn't sure if I was ever gonna get there. But looking back now, I, I should have known that I could get there because I have those skills and that interest in continuously learning, uh, investing in myself, uh, working well with others, and uh, achieving those, uh, applying those leadership skills we talked about. So I think that's something that you should all embrace <coughs> and accept in your day to day that you have that ability. You chart your own course. No one else charts it for you. Uh, you may be dealt some uh, variables and some impacts along the way that you feel like, oh, that's going to define me. That's going to limit me. I can't do this. You know, don't ever say I can't. But there are variables that are out of your control. But more often, you have control over where you're going to go, what you invest your time and talents in, and what that can translate to in terms of what you value as success. Every one of us has a different measure of success and what uh, criteria you might hold yourself to to make sure that you're achieving a level of success. Um, that's, I think that's the other part that I would impair is that in part that is that uh, you what you value is is most important to you it doesn't matter what other people think of you or what they are comparing you to all that matters is what you value and what you uh, call success and if, if you can achieve that you know that's that's the, the epitome i think um yeah this may, may have something to do with the fact that i'm um, the director of the mba program here but can you tell us how does an mba help somebody move into a leadership role. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. The, the MBA was really a wake-up call for me. I didn't realize when I started, I, I knew, this is where I came from. I have three friends of about my age. Uh, one got his MBA very early in life. He was a chemical engineer, but went right on to get his MBA. And um, he's still a very valued advisor to me. When I have a scenario at work that I don't know how to handle, and more times than not, it's you know, HR or finance or you know, some aspect that I was not trained to handle. I can tell you how to you know, calculate the friction loss in a pipe, but I can't tell you how to address an employee's need on an HR function. I'll call him because he has an MBA, and I, I valued that just because I saw the initial. But what I realized is it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's a way that you can apply broader general business information and knowledge and apply it to each situation. Uh, just having the vocabulary about uh, behaviors and uh, financial aspects and the marketing and advertising, just having that full service big picture about how a business functions and where it's headed, that, uh, without that, I was feeling very underprepared and, and ill-equipped to, to guide uh, you know, 170 people on making sure they get a paycheck every two weeks. So I think the MBA, and what I value about it is uh, I, I did it later in life. So I had all the life experiences of trying to work in this industry and seeing companies that I worked for you know, succeed or fail, I can look back and say, well, that's what they, maybe they should have done it differently and, and you know, played it out in my head. But I had, uh, I mentioned the one advisor, two other advisors or peers of my age that have an MBA. And it just, when you put those three in a room compared to any of my other friends, the level of, uh, Thoughtfulness, uh, assessment, wh wh whatever you say, uh, the dialogue that happens with those folks is, is at a higher caliber and a more constructive than it is anyone without that. So I think the MBA really prepared them. I'm, I'm a, I'm, um, I, said, I said, you each chart your own course. My son's not going to chart his own course. I'm going to tell him he's got to get an MBA. <laughs> he's an engineer right now. But I said, you're, you, you really need to broaden your uh, knowledge base and skill set uh, to be fully effective in any kind of business environment. And most of us work in a business environment. There's a, there's a lot of other organizations uh, that you may go uh, work for or do valuable work in. But the, the private sector, the business aspect, even public sector, uh, it's still a business. It still has to achieve a certain amount of uh, uh, success and deliver results for at a certain expense to be efficient. So it's, it's all, the MBA really does guide your way of thinking uh, much more comprehensively than, than any other background training you would have collected. That's, that's well, great. I, I couldn't agree more, right? <laughs> <Because> I, <laughs> but it's the yeah, Appreciate the required. Yeah. Um, tell, 
let's talk a little bit about the, the, your communication strategy and marketing strategy for, for your particular business. Because of course, uh, marketing can involve everything from the kind of consulting work that you do and uh, personal selling all the way through to television advertising or any type of uh, social media presence, even your YouTube channel is a, is a form of uh, interaction with your, your uh, potential clients. Could you talk with us, first of all, about how do you see your, um, your constituency? How do, are, do you consider them primarily, um, you're primarily in, the, in uh, a business to consumer kind of a conversation, or is this a business to business conversation, or is it kind of a mix? And uh, then what are some of the central keys in that communication? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's uh, something we continually, uh, not grapple with, but uh, evolve. It evolves over time. You know, 10, 15 years ago, our marketing was very simplistic. We'd had one person responsible uh, to, and marketing is different than sales. It, it's, our marketing is all about uh, our image, our culture, uh, just the, the big, broader picture of when you see the SCE logo, what do you think of? Um, the sales, that's the targeted efforts that we, the tactics that we apply to uh, entice a client to want to hire us. Uh, our, our business, it's a business, there's a combination of business to uh, consumer type relationship, but a lot of our clients are other businesses like utilities. So they have a, a, an ex, a requirement to deliver utility service to their customers. And then we provide an engineering service to enable them to do that more efficiently or effectively or in, in accordance with regulations, what have you. So, so we're, we're dealing with other businesses there. That's the relationship we like the most because they're the most uh, professional to deal with and uh, they appreciate what it is we bring to the table. Uh, whereas a, a consumer or even like I'd say a private homeowner who has an engineering need, they have a, an insurance issue with their home and they need an engineer to design you know, something around that to fix it. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't necessarily value what we do as highly as other uh, industries. So, so we have uh, marketed ourselves specifically to the utility industry because that's the one that's most rewarding to us and the easiest to, that we're, we're, we're set up to be able to deliver those services. So our communication to them and with them is all about um, what we do best and where we benefit for others and that they would benefit from that too. So how do we get that message across? We we uh, promote ourselves at uh, trade shows, technology, give technical presentations about our latest and greatest uh, project and successes and challenges that we learned along the way. When they sit in an audience and hear us talk about our experience, that opens their mind to say, that firm probably could handle my problem because every one of them has the same problem that our current client had. So it's really just a matter of leveraging our uh, marketing footprint to a broader audience and places to do that at the trade shows, uh, promotional, we do advertise in some print media, but not a lot. Um, <clears throat> it's really about the relationship. If you can get in, in person, we have one very uh, successful strategy going right now for the gas utilities. Um, they have an obligation under the regulations to know where all their gas pipes are, how old they are, what condition they're in. And the day they got installed to the day they get retired, they have to have a digital uh, means of tracking that information. And that's where our geographic information system services comes in. If we can entice them to have us on the job the day they install a pipe, we collect all that data, the company who installed it, the size of the pipe, the condition, all these things. And then we manage that database for the 50, 75 years that they have this asset until it's retired. So we're, we're going out aggressively to specific utility companies and saying, here's the process that we've developed that makes that very easy. You can have us do it for you. You don't have to worry about it. It complies with the regs. It's, uh, it's, it's been very effective. So we found a niche. We found a way to reach those clients through communications and outreach. And that's how we're getting our name out there. And, and it's getting more and more widely recognized. So that communication strategy we're not a uh, shotgun approach. We are, I'll say, very specific in our tactics and measures that we use to promote our name in the industry, in certain industries where we can be most effective and most uh, competitive. Uh, you know, we don't want to go against some of the other very big firms who do other big work all the time, and we're just cutting our teeth on that. So we're, we're very careful about where we promote ourselves. 
So that uh, the marketing and the sales are really, they're related, but we treat them differently. Um, and we are getting much more strategic now about what we pursue and where we pursue it. Because it's a big investment. Um, it's a big cost. We're, as I said, we're 11 people, salaries, promotional efforts, travel, printing, uh, digital media. You know, that's probably 5% of our company's budget. And in a business where we have about a 20% profitability, you know, if I didn't spend that money, I'd have 25% profitability for one year. But we gotta make sure we maintain that investment. Um, so it's it's a big number. What are some of the most uh, creative ways that you can try to, try to connect with people that you may not otherwise be connected to? So one, one tool we're using is if you can bring in, at least it's probably true in every industry, if, if you have a, a customer or a client that has a need, but they don't have a way to get to the solution. And you can bring them the solution. Okay, we bring the technical solution, but if we also bring the funding mechanism with us, it's a no-brainer. They're gonna say, I'll hire you, because you not only bring the solution, but you bring me the way to pay for it. And a lot of this is like, uh, you know, the infrastructure funding and bills that are all now, you know, under, available to uh, everyone. We're, we are experts at knowing where those funds how they get administered, how they get applied to certain eligible projects. And we go find the clients that have the need for those projects, and we bring the funding solution along with the technical solution, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> very easy. <laughs> so being able to really understand the needs of the, the that, business consumer. That's for sure. That provides. That the, the customer has the need. You have to understand their need better than they do. I wonder if there's some questions uh, that may, I have some more questions, but maybe there's some questions. Anybody gonna go into engineering after this? <laughs> which, which kind of leads us to another kind of question. Um, you talk about organizational culture. So, so uh, I came from Tennessee, so uh, Oak Ridge was close to where I work for. Major, lots of engineers. Right, and so, are, do engineers bring a different perspective to an organizational culture? So, if if these students uh, may find themselves working in a firm that has a lot of engineers, right, is is there a different kind of cultural perspective? Yeah, there there is no culture. <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 not the ones you go out and uh, celebrate after work with. <laughs> But in general, yeah, they do have a way of thinking, as I've talked about the linear thinking. Uh, you know, the traditional engineer is, uh, is very rigid and uh, methodical in the process and maybe not exhibiting all the leadership skills. That's where in the consulting engineering world, we try to find the people with a broader uh, skill set than just the technical. Uh, we're the business first and we happen to do engineering. So that's where we, we try to find those candidates that can fit that mold. But, and when you work with engineers in larger organizations, um, uh, there's the, the engineers is a right way and a wrong way. Sometimes there's nothing in between, and that's uh, that can be challenging to work with. Um, you know, they always seem to have the answer. Or they they believe that that's their job is to provide the answer, and they're going to give you the answer. But it may not be the answer that's best or the one that you agree with. So now, how do you interact with this technically minded, uh, seasoned professional? Uh, and and are they approachable and humble enough to, to listen to what you have to say? Um, so that, that can be the challenge. I think the culture of a truly technical uh, workforce uh, that's used to you know, being the, the, the answer person and in an environment where you know, if part of the organization uh, may have other needs and other goals than just the technical part, and sometimes there can be friction there. So, I mean, any more uh, with the computer technology and uh, coding and programming, you know, the engineers are having to adapt and work much more cooperatively with other, I'll say, non-engineering folks in the development of solutions, um, you know, uh, computer software, everything else. Like we, even our uh, enterprise management software that we run our company with, um, <clears throat> we're switching to new platforms. We can't even find one that does everything our current one does because everything's good and moved to the cloud and it has far less capabilities than what we have on, on prep. So we're struggling as engineers and our non-engineering financial uh, marketing and accounting folks who use that tool. And we all have to work together to say, these are our priorities. 
let's, let's find a product that's out there or let's develop a product on our own that's gonna solve all our problems. So uh, anymore, I think there's a blended hybrid approach when engineers are involved and the non-engineers and having to compel them to work together. Uh, I, I would say that the younger engineers we have are very capable of interacting with others and they're not so rigid. It's, those days are gone, I think, uh, which I'm happy to say. You know, that any more of the curriculum in engineering is still very technical, but there's a lot more focus on uh, the emotional intelligence, the people skills, the ability to communicate, and that goes a long way to, to bridging those uh, otherwise chasms that, that can exist. Can you explain to us how um, your organization is structured? Now, you're the CEO, so you're at the top, but uh, tell us a little bit about the structure, structuring, and has it been restructured over time? It has, yeah. So the company has evolved in four decades. Uh, it started out as just five equal partners. It was a, a very small <coughs> partnership, like a professional uh, uh, partnership, or it's a corporation, but still. Uh, each five had a role, and one kind of took the management role of the organization. And that got us through the first 10 years. But as we grew, we became 20 people, 30 people. Now you start to take on a much larger uh, footprint. And not, just that one person can't manage all the affairs. So then you either bring in other expertise um, specific to the topic that they need, or some of the other owners in a professional corporation like ours, uh, in fact, to be licensed in certain states, the, the leader of the company has to be a licensed professional engineer. So uh, right now, we don't meet that criteria because our current president, while she went to school for engineering, she never went to get her actual license uh, to be a licensed professional engineer. She's more focused on the running affairs of the business. So uh, a large corporation like ours, right now we're structured with a president, I'm the executive vice president, um, and we have other officers of the company, uh, treasurer, uh, secretary, another VP of engineering. Um, so that's how we're structured, the, the senior leadership team. Uh, but, and not all of them are owners anymore. It used to be that everybody who was in leadership was an owner. We've gotten so large now that not, that's not the case anymore. Um, so, so it, it, it's, but it varies by company. It's not, our industry isn't always structured the same way with the president and officers. Uh, there can be equal partnerships still um, of companies our size, or uh, they could be a, a, eventually a, a public corporation, um, you know, where you have investors and you know, outside shareholders. Uh, right now, we're all closely held. All our shares of our company are, own, are held by uh, owners of the company. Right now we have eight owners of the company, so 170 person firm, um, that's how we're structured. We, we used to use ownership as the incentive to really get somebody to, to step up and do more than they would otherwise, because they had an incentive. If you're an owner, at the end of the year, you share in the profit of the company, so that's your motivation, right? You're gonna, you're gonna work nights, you're gonna work weekends, you're gonna do whatever it takes to create the most profit possible because that's your incentive. You're gonna get your share at the end of the year. Um, and that's usually a motivating force. Not always, it can be challenging, especially in a downtime when you do all those hard efforts and there's not much profit left. You're like, why did I do all that? Let me figure out what I earned per hour when I plug in the number of hours I actually booked, or the number of dinners I missed with my family because I had a night meeting, and all these kind of things. So it's, it's a level of commitment, um, but you know, as a closely held corporation, that's, that's how we're structured. But there are many of consulting engineering firms, and they call it AE firms, architectural and engineering uh, professional service companies, uh, many of which are, uh, are public and uh, have uh, public shares. One, one last thing, I wondered if you might talk to us about uh, your logo design oh. and its kind of meaning. So I'm gonna pull this up here. Yeah. It's, uh, named Suburban Consulting Engineers because we were in a suburban area originally, and the five owners didn't want to call it, uh, you know, Miller, Smith, Johnson, whatever, uh, you know, because once those names have retired or moved on, the firm kind of loses a little meaning. So they were very, I give the, the founding fathers of our company uh, a lot of credit for creating a name that can uh, outlive uh, any one person, and that was very good foresight because I was the second generation of the owners. The first five all retired. I bought my shares from some of them. 
and now I've already just now sold my shares to the third generation. And uh, by, by matter of how we're structured, three of the five, three of the, well, I'm a, uh, three of us old guys are just about out. So there's really five principal owners, three of which are women. So we're a diverse business, we're a woman-owned business at this point, which is very positive in terms of uh, attracting and retaining uh, a lot of our employees and also um, helping a lot of our clients achieve their uh, DEI objectives and goals. So uh, but our logo, the, the, the SCE, we started, you know, suburban consulting engineers is a very long phrase. So we like to use the abbreviated SCE as much as possible. And that, uh, I'll tell you, I'm surprised how many times they get stopped with the logo and they ask me what religious organization I'm with. Because we have the crosshairs and it kind of looks like a cross a little bit. But it's really the crosshairs of a, of a surveyor's scope uh, when you look through a, a surveying instrument. That's how it comes from. But, uh, so we, we've created this logo probably 15 years ago. Actually, we paid a graphic artist to come up with it, and we, we liked it. So um, we've, it's evolved over time a few times. But in general, it was always the SCE uh, overload, lined up with each other. And, um, and it's, people do recognize it now. At least people that are familiar with our work in our industry, they know that SCE is Suburban Consulting Engineers. We, we're able to not add the words and just have the logo. And I'll say at least 50% of the people that see it know, know who it represents. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. That's what I was kind of imagining. But I did see the cross in there. So I, yeah. but I, I, but I, I figured it was uh, the <laughs> surveyor tool. It catches, the, so, catches your eye. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and um, and this is a centerpiece in a lot of your marketing material. It, it is the centerpiece. I mean, everything we have and do, uh, you know, all of our products, my, my backpack has it on, on the front. Um, you know, our shirts, all our printed literature has it all. So it's, it's the common theme in everything we do. We have changed our color scheme a few times, but in general, that logo has always been there. It's on all our company fleet. We have probably 50 vehicles. Um, it's just, it's, it surrounds everything that we do from a promotional standpoint, uh, because it's good for our clients to see it, but it's equally important for our, our workforce and our team members to feel good about who they're associated with. Uh, all our hard hats have it on it. Uh, every, we, we always joke, I mean, you take this shirt off and, you know, Printed on your skin is also so you can see it at the beach, but um, it's uh, yeah, it's, we're, we're very proud of it, and it, it is gaining. You know, it's been four decades now, but it is gaining in uh, notoriety and recognition. Yeah, that's that's great. I wonder just before um, tomorrow, you're going to be uh, having time to uh, be available to students. Is this primarily? This is not necessarily engineering students. This is. And do you have a particular kind of internships or jobs that you're, you're, you're searching for? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I, I, I was happy to offer to come do this because two things. One is, you know, I, I have a fond um, knowledge of and, and history with Houghton with my daughter being here. Uh, but secondly, you know, I'm proud to highlight what uh, a career path can look like for anyone of any background. And uh, as a firm now, just uh, we still do engineering and landscape architecture, but we're running a business, as I said first, so there's a lot of aspects of our business that have needs. Um, the marketing, uh, the sales, the finance department, we have a finance department of five people that does all our invoicing, accounts receivable, billing, uh, so there's a lot of interesting tasks there. Uh, a, a human resources department, uh, I mentioned IT, uh, other than the, the non-technical admin department, uh, where we manage a lot of our uh, product deliverable, our, our production of our projects, uh, all the media that we put out. So it's um, our needs are wide, and as I said, we can train anyone to do anything with the right character. So we're always looking for eligible, capable candidates who have an interest to work with a firm like ours. And even if you don't have the perfect background, if you have the right character and commitment, we, we, we'd rather hire that candidate than somebody who says, oh, I have my accounting degree and I can you know, serve a role in your uh, finance department but necessarily doesn't have uh, uh, the right uh, character or, or the, the, the passion for that work. <clears throat> so, so I would say yes, we have a, uh, an interest in, in many areas, and you know, I'm happy to talk to each and every one of you about where your interests lie, and you know, maybe, I, maybe there's not a role at our company, 
but maybe we know other people where there's an opportunity. So that's part of my role to be here is just to enable each of you to uh, learn more about what I know in an industry and share it with you so that you can gather more of that information, um, you know, further use it to find your path. So uh, the internships, though, is, is a huge part of our recruiting uh, effort. Anymore, it's very difficult for us to find um, candidates, uh, and, and there's really a limit on um, how many are out there that are really uh, qualified and or are interested in working with us. So we like to cast a wider net. This is part of that effort. I'm, I'm happy to be here for that. But internships, even after your freshman year, we love that. If you're if you're available for your freshman summer, you know, rising sophomore, and then again rising junior. Those two summers, if you can come to us back to back, we have learned more about you than your folks know about you. And that's a great tool for us to be able to then decide, are you a good fit for us? When you leave your junior year, you typically, if you're one of those candidates, you have an offer already. An offer letter when you go back uh, to your senior year, you've already got an opportunity to say, I've got a job, here's where it's gonna be, here's what my salary's gonna be. Like, that's our best chance to have a successful recruitment and retention program, because what we find is, once you've had it two summers to see who we are, you've interviewed us just as aggressively, right? And if it's a good fit, that's our best chance of success. We don't, uh, it's a very big investment for us to bring somebody on, train them on the skills that they need, and have them leave after six months or nine months. That's a, that's a lost opportunity for us. We really need you to be here for years for us to gain back that investment. And that's, uh, there's, a, there's a saying, and it may not be popular, but we hire slow, fire fast. <clears throat> if you're just not a good fit, and we see that there's better opportunities for you elsewhere, we're gonna help you see that quickly. But if, we're also gonna interview you very carefully, slowly, to measure your character, <clears throat> your skills, your commitment to us. I apologize. <coughs> and that's, that's really how we approach it. And I think a lot of firms approach it the same way. On that note, let me just say, I wanted to confirm before I misspoke, but this is interviews tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock at Till Chapel. You'll see if you go to the hub or any of the advertising, we'll say 11.30. Do not miss Chapel because we said 11.30. So uh, we will be by the fireplace in the campus center. And it's free form. If you can come in, drop by a little bit. If you want to sit and chat a while with Andrew, he's more than willing. We can talk to multiple people at once. Sure. Don't be shy. Just come join us. Any questions, he's wide open. And he's got a lot of great experience I know he can share. And some of you will end up with jobs, I'll guarantee you. You're the right fit. He's looking for you. Well, let's, uh, let's give uh, Mr. Holt. I hope we got something of value. And I'm, again, I'm happy to speak to each one of you today or tomorrow. If you swing by, that's fine. I can stop this, I guess, so he'll edit it, right? Yeah, it can be. So Let's it's, um, got to be stopped. Right up there, I think. Is that it? Maybe not? No? Yeah. On off. I got Sorry, on off. Okay. Yeah. We start to stop.